Since it's the anniversary, let's start at least with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and let's remind everybody exactly what went on 10 years ago. We'll put up a, a chart here that shows they were responsible for $5 trillion, roughly, in mortgages, either guaranteed or granted. The government went and said $100 billion for each, Fannie and Freddie. We're going to wipe out the shareholders. We're going to replace the management. To, and, but at the same time, Hank Paulson said this is just a timeout. It's a temporary thing. Ten years later, it's still in conservatorship. Shocker, right? Yeah. I mean, um, and you know, one of the most striking things, like listening to, to, to Hank's words 10 years later, in, I mean, he talks about how these two entities are so large and so interwoven that the failure of either one of them, the, the havoc it would wreak on the global economy, and, but that this is, but we need a permanent change, right? Not only Fannie and Freddie, but think about how many other large financial institutions in this country fit that definition back then, which triggered not only the bailout of Fannie and Freddie, but of all of our giant commercial and investment banks, and how true those definitions are still today, and how little has been done to make those permanent changes. So here we are with Fannie and Freddie, 10 years later, um, and they're still so huge and still so interwoven and still completely dependent on, on the taxpayer. So explain that, unpack that a little bit, because on the one hand, we hear too big to fail is not fixed. We have some people say too, it's still too big to fail. On the other hand, we hear it's a much safer system. We've got a lot more reserves in the banks, a lot better. How do you square those two things? Well, I think there's a big difference between being safer and safe. Right? And I think there's no question, when you look at the, the eve of the financial crisis 10 years ago, we are safer. There is more capital at the big financial institutions, and that's good. But that also doesn't mean that we're, we're where we need to be. I mean, because these institutions that are even bigger than they were back then, they're just, if not more, interwoven as they were back then. And still, as Hank said, the failure of any one would still wreak the same type of global havoc today as it would then. It's a little bit less likely because of the increased capital, but it's not enough capital, particularly when you see what's going on in Washington and all this pressure to make them less safe and get us even closer to where we were in 2008. But Constance, the, the issue with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac now is the government's still privatization of the institutions, when at the end of the day, that's really a political uh, bipartisan partisan issue. It's not actually about their health. Would that be accurate? I think that is accurate, and I think, I think what we see is that entrenched institutions like this, it becomes very hard to change them, even in times where we have immense cooperation across the aisle, right, as we did after the financial crisis. There was a real um, sort of suspension of partisan politics for, for a period of time. And we don't have that suspension of partisan, partisan politics now, so I think um, making significant progress is going to be even more challenging. So, so Nita, for some time now, as I understand it, Fannie and Freddie have to return all the profits they make to the federal government. So they're the federal government. Is this a partisan issue about how we handle handling housing, or is it actually sort of a little bit of a drug for the government? Because they're getting a lot of money in. At the same time, Fannie and Freddie are not plowing any more capital back into the business. I want someone to just keep giving me money. Well, exactly. Just That's all your great. profits. I'll take all your I profits. I take a loan. I get paid I mean, back. I think yeah. they've repaid all the money given them, plus something like $100 billion. I mean, it's been a good deal in that sense for the U.S. government. Right. I think that, um, I think that you know, I totally agree that if we talk about um, how the system has changed since the global financial crisis till now, that uh, specifically that the banks having higher capital just gives you more of a buffer um, to limit contagion. But it's not going to, as, as you said, we're not necessarily where we need to be. Um, and same with Fannie and Freddie. Well, and uh, Tim Geithner uh, recently was quoted in a Bloomberg article talking about something along those lines. He says, look, if you apply constraints on risk taking to only part of the financial system, say just the banks, and allow other types of financial institutions to operate outside those constraints, then you will leave the overall financial system less resilient and banks themselves may look more stable, but their role in the system will shrink over time. It really encapsulates where companies get their money from today. Neil, what do you think about that? I think it's like many things that have come out of uh, former secretary. Secretary Geithner's mouth um, doesn't make a, a ton of sense really? uh, because the difference between the large financial institutions and other companies in the private sector is they're not guaranteed by the federal government. Mm. And you know, you sort of go back. Yeah, it's been a good deal for the taxpayer, the, the sweep of, of profits from Fannie and Freddie. But the flip side of that is that they're not recapitalized. So when the market turns and they start suffering losses, it's going to be a very, very bad deal for the taxpayer. But Neil, go back 10 years ago. Uh, did Hank Paulson bail out Fannie and Freddie because they'd been implicitly guaranteed by the federal government? Or did he bail them out because he had huge bondholders around the world, mm -hmm. including Japanese institutions, the Japanese government, that were so interdependent? And whether you're guaranteed or not, a lot of the big players now, the Blackrocks of this world, the Berkshire Hathaways of this world, if they went south, there'd be a 
lot of disruption globally. I mean, there is a question whether Too Big to Fail has, has expanded beyond the giant financial institutions. Uh, and look, back then, of course, not only did you have the big banks, you had Fannie and Freddie, AIG, uh, obviously, Too Big to Fail. Um, and, and that sort of the, goes back to the core problem, is that have we really solved the problem of large interwoven institutions um, that, are, that are explicitly on the government dime, which Fannie and Freddie most certainly are, um, and those that are still implicitly guaranteed, which create situations like Fannie and Freddie, where you know those, ins those bondholders lent money to Fannie and Freddie, even though you could look at them and knew they were undercapitalized, knew they took too much risk, but you knew that, that Hank or someone else would come in and bail them out. And how many other institutions still look like that today, creating those same risks and continuing this, this really centuries-old cycle of boom, bust, and bailout? And not even just banks. I mean, you come inside the Bloomberg, it's a little snapshot of some corporate leverage, and this is just the leverage loan and junk bond market. And I say just because there's a lot more money out there, and you can see uh, what we've gone since 2008 and how high we went uh, in 2017. But Constance, my concern is that the leverage not reflected in this chart. So shadow banks, so uh, banks that have offshoots that they're lending to riskier areas, private equity, that because banks were regulated so toughly that companies and individuals got money somewhere else. And that's kind of like an unspoken leverage that could unwind. So I think there's two things to unpack here. One is even the regulated institutions had risks that the regulators didn't foresee, mm -hmm. right? So this idea that shadow banks contain all this risk we don't know about, and, and it's much riskier than when everything was, was under the regulatory umbrella, is kind of a red herring. Because when things were under the regulatory umbrella, there were risks that weren't seen mm -hmm. that preceded the, the financial crisis. So I, I don't think that there it is actually possible to have that crystal ball um, unless you are specifically looking for cracks in the system. Uh, and so if we look now, yes, there is a risk with shadow banking and, and certainly I would say the levered loan market is an area where one should be paying close attention because that is someplace where cracks are going to come. But if you think of uh, this type of risk, uh, I, I use an analogy like an avalanche. So avalanches are very, very difficult to forecast and there's a lot of science between trying to understand how to forecast them. And there's a, there's a mathematical procedure called critical state theory which basically analyzes the um, each snowflake falls and if it f normally a snowflake falls it's stable it lands on the mountain everything is good but occasionally snowflakes fall that that aren't stable and when you get a cluster of unstable snowflakes that's when you get an avalanche so I would look not just what's going on here in the US at the debt market but I would look around the world for possible clusters of unstable snowflakes and and that's what we need to be looking for Neil, you were part of fighting the last war. We often prepare for the last war, not the next one. Mm -hmm. Where's the next crisis going to come from that we are not anticipating? So if I knew the answer to that question, <laughs> Michael Lewis would write his next book about how I became a billionaire. Um, so, so, you know, look, leverage loan markets, I think for years, right? I mean, this has been a, a source of risk, when, especially when you see these covenant light loans that are, that are going in there and these basic protections that help fuel, uh, you know, a lot of the problems in the, in, in the residential mortgage space and how that's being replicated. But my bigger concern is we're going to have another crisis, right? Something's going to trigger. The question is, is the depth and severity of that crisis and whether we're going to be looking something that goes back to the Great Depression or the Great Recession. And that's where the concern is. And I think that's where we really need to make sure that rather than undoing some of the reforms, we need to be doubling down on them, particularly when it comes to, to capital. And, and not just that, but there was a paper out yesterday where a lot of central bankers were weighing in saying that they don't have the ammunition to fight another crisis, that they've really been mm hammered. -hmm. Strong. So aside from the actual regulation, that is the second tier risk of another crisis. Right, absolutely. And that, so I, I completely think we've made incremental progress since the global financial crisis with banks having more capital, more transparency into financial products. Even if you look at global debt, uh, global debt is similar to, to 2008 levels. However, more is held by governments than consumers. So governments have more tools to handle it. And talking about tools, that's why we think the Fed is closer to the end of its rate hiking cycle. Uh, than the beginning so as not to trigger, uh, especially when you're not seeing inflation um, in the economy.